Now, at this point, I'm going to go ahead and turn over the stage to Matt Ramsey, who's going to talk about the science of singing. Yeah. How we doing, Nerd Night? Woo! Let's keep those woos going. We're going to talk about the acoustics of woos. Maybe next time. So my name is Matt Ramsey, and I am a singing teacher, and I'm the founder of RamseyVoice.com and Ramsey Voice Studio right here in Austin, Texas. And the theme of this evening is expanding. And so what we want to talk about this evening is expanding range. We want to talk about hitting high notes. Now, Amy's told me I have about 20 minutes to teach everyone in here how to sing. So we'd better get started. If you want to, you can reach out to me anytime. Uh, my website, RamseyVoice.com. I've got a YouTube channel with tons of singing videos at Ramsey Voice Studio. And I also have a complete video singing course. Uh, enrollment opens up again next month. It's called Master Your Voice. Check it out. There's links all over my website for it. Now, let's talk about high notes. How do you hit high notes? Well, everybody knows that you have to sing from the diaphragm. You need to sing into the mask, you need to cover the sound, and you need to lift your chin in order to sing high notes, right? We've all been told that, we've all heard that, we've seen that on America's Got Talent. But what if those don't work? And interestingly enough, learning to sing high notes without breaking or straining has actually been a problem since almost as soon as people started learning how to teach singing. And so today, we're actually going to talk about this small group of monks, Gregorian monks, back in the 7th century, who got it all figured out. They got it all figured out, and then we forgot about it. So today, we can actually see the influence of these guys in all of the singers that are pictured here, and a lot more. So why has this idea of breath support and singing from the diaphragm and singing into the mask and all these ideas, not that they're incorrect per se, but why have they stuck around for so long? Well, there's a lot of good reasons for this. Um, a couple of interesting things about the voice as an instrument. You can't see it unless you have a special instrument. You can't touch it. And it actually sounds different to you than pretty much anybody else that's around you, which we all know, right? Like, oh, I sound great. Well, let's talk about that. <laughs> and actually, until the 90s, there was very little vocal science that was actually done around the singing voice. And there's a lot of good reasons for that, but primarily, it has to do with these exact reasons. We couldn't see it, we couldn't touch it, and there weren't a lot of great ways to measure it. So there was a lot of trial and error that was involved in teaching people how to sing and teaching people how to sing high notes without breaking or straining. So today, I wanna to tell you really quickly about these cool monks that had it all figured out and why it's taken us so long to actually prove them right. So in order to understand where we are today, we have to look at where we were. So we look back to the seventh century and we have one of the very first schools of singing. It's the Scola Cantorum. And it's actually the very first school that's teaching these monks how to sing in the Gregorian choir for the papal choir. They're singing for the Pope. And singing training took nine years. So I try to tell my students that, but they don't seem to all stick around for nine years for some reason. Um, and what was interesting about that is that obviously we know that monks have a lot of time on their hands. And this actually led us to the very first breakthrough in the teaching and the science of singing, which is that these guys were the very first people to classify the voice according to way that it felt for the singer. So if you think about the voice, you can't see it, you can't touch it, sounds different to you than anyone else. How do you actually teach someone to do that? You can't just say, ah, and they automatically sing, ah, right back to you. Well, actually, these guys discovered that if you told people how singing was supposed to feel, and you start to define some of the different ways that singing is supposed to feel in different parts of your body, you can start to sing, teach singing much more effectively. And these guys, we have to thank for terms that we even use today, chest voice and head voice. Has anyone heard that before? Give me a woo if you have. That was some very good head voice, everyone. But in case you haven't, go ahead and place your hand on your chest. You're going to have to set your drink down. Um, and go ahead and say, hi, Matt, nice and strong. Hi, Matt. Does everyone feel a little bit of that vibration against their chest? 
If so, you have these monks to thank because they were the first to define this zone of singing, which they called the chest voice. And just like you illustrated before, place your hand on the back of your neck and go, woo! woo! And again, you'll feel that vibration against the back of your neck, in your head. You'll feel this kind of in the top part of your voice. And this is what we called the head voice. Fantastic. We got a lot of beautiful singers here tonight. Now, there was a problem. And the problem is that as soon as they discovered these different zones of singing, they realized that a lot of people couldn't transition between them very cleanly. So they would have a ah, ah, happen every time they tried to sing from the bottom to the top part of their voice. Now, what is the monk's solution to this? Well, they've got a lot of time on their hands. They've got access to singers all across Italy. And so what they do is they decide to study the so-called natural singers, the people that could naturally ah, from the bottom part to the top part of their voice without straining or breaking. And what they found was actually leading us to the second breakthrough in the study and the teaching of singing, which is the discovery of the middle voice. So we've got chest voice, we've got this bottom part, we've got woo, we've got this high part, this head voice. But these guys actually through a lot of trial and error and a lot of intuitive thinking, they found that natural singers kind of felt that they were singing through this kind of like middle zone in the middle of their voice. So by doing that, rather than ah, uh, they found that they could ah, uh, sing through that middle part of their voice. Now, there were a lot of different names for this, and we still have a lot of different names for this today. Some people call it the mixed voice. Some people call it the middle voice. Some people call it the pharyngeal, the bratty, all sorts of different names for it. But the bottom line is that they found by singing in a very specific kind of way with some very ugly sounds that you could unify the bottom part of your voice with the top part of your voice in between. And that was so, so important because even in Gregorian chants, some people had to sing up to those high notes because remember, women were not allowed to sing in the choir at this time. So you've got all these guys, they have no idea how to sing high notes and this is exactly how they learned to do it. Now, what does that sound like? It's pretty gross, but if you've seen any of my YouTube videos or you want to check it out later, a bratty nay is a great example of this. Nay, 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 nay. This allows me to actually transition rather than I can nay, 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 nay. I can actually transition between that different parts in my voice. Now, I want to emphasize that these guys had no idea what was causing this. They just realized, huh, he does that really weird, funny sound, and all of a sudden his voice is working a lot better. And so all things are very good. Everyone's living in peace and harmony for several hundred years. And let's fast forward. Now we have a big problem in the romantic area, and specifically with Beethoven, who almost single-handedly ushers in the romantic era of music, which is that orchestras are now double in size. So whereas before, it was great that you could, you could sing that nice, bratty, ugly sound and start to transition into mom, into prettier sounds, all of a sudden I'm competing with 12 bassoons and I cannot be heard. <laughs> so, this really puzzled the voice teachers at the time. And this is where we actually start to see some of these ideas for the first time. Their, their, their ideas were, oh, well, you just need to support the breath. You need to sing into the mask. You need more breath control. You need to sing into the palate. All of these ideas were basically attempts to, oh my God, how do I get this guy to sing stronger? Now, what was the problem with this? Well, for a while, this idea of the middle voice was kind of forgotten because if you didn't have that middle voice, if you had a break in your voice, well, you were just told to sing with more breath support. Well, you just need to support it more. <gasps> oh! And what happens? My break actually gets worse. And this idea sticks around for a really, really long time. But all the while, there's a couple of Italian singers that are still taught in this old school Italian school style. And they're kind of the rock stars of their day. People are looking at them, uh, uh, singers like Benjamino Gigli and Enrico Caruso. These are amazing singers and they're the toast of all of Italy and the world because they can do this amazing thing that they can sing those top notes in their voice without breaking or straining and they don't even seem to be trying. But again, the idea of this middle voice is almost totally forgotten. For, well, that was a very good, a chew. That was like, that was a C-sharp five, very good. Give her a hand.
So this actually sticks around for a couple hundred years. And then again, the idea of the middle voice is kind of forgotten. It's kind of set off to the side. And that is until 1854 when Manuel Garcia invents the laryngoscope, which is the very first time that we can actually see the vocal cords. So he takes, yeah, it looks like a medieval torture device. <laughs> So he, he takes this metal rod and he actually puts some mirrors on it and through a series of mirrors and with the reflection of the sun, you can actually see the vocal cords for the first time. And the reason that this is a big deal is because for the very first time, we actually see what the heck is going on in people's throats. So people aren't actually singing from their chest. They're not actually singing from their head. They're actually, all the singing is coming directly from the throat and from the vocal cords in particular. And this is the very first time that we realize, wait a second, breath is not like the entire picture here. There's some very important stuff that's going on. But again, voice teachers really don't quite know how to use this information just yet. They keep doing the same thing, breathing from the diaphragm, singing into the mast. Now, that brings us into the early 20th century. And of course, singing changes a lot. We've got jazz, we've got blues, and all of a sudden it's not about oh, singing operatic style anymore. There's tutti frutti, oh, rudy. We've got some really, really kind of belty, strong, raw, emotional, and clear and exciting sounds. And again, voice teachers have no idea what to do about this because you can't sing and sound good. It just doesn't, it just doesn't have that same thing. The kids aren't digging it for some reason. And again, we have this big lag where nobody's figuring any of this stuff out until the 1960s, where there's a young singing teacher. He was young at that time. He's very old in this picture. Um, he graduates from the opera school uh, in Manhattan, and he's got all these pieces of paper. He's got a master's degree that says that he's this amazing tenor singer, but he can't sing through the middle part of his voice. Every time he tries to sing high notes, he, ah, he has a big break in the middle of his voice. And he's so frustrated by this, he decides to look back at some of the texts that were written by some of those old school Italian singers. And what he finds is he rediscovers this idea of the middle voice. Now, why is this important? This is important because this is the very first teacher to say, oh, wait, we can just apply some of the same ideas of this middle voice and uniting all of the vocal registers to modern music. So rather than, oh, you need to learn opera if you want to sing rock and roll. You want to sing that blues, kid? You better take, you know, five years of opera training. They're very, very different styles of music. And he was the very first person to kind of recognize that. And he had a lot of success because he taught all of these singers and plenty more, Madonna, Anthony Kiedis, uh, Bette Midler, Bette Midler's on there. Uh, but there's a lot, I mean, the list goes on and on. And he's basically the go-to guy in Los Angeles to learn how to sing. And it's all basically because he rediscovered these old texts and he had some of these intuitions about how to develop that middle part of your voice. But again, because the science of singing is so far back, a lot of it is still just trial and error. A lot of it is just his idea. But uh, Seth Riggs' idea of how the voice works is that basically you've got the bottom part of your voice, you've got the top part of your voice, and the two need to kind of hand off from one to the other. But if one muscle is too dominant, or if one part of your voice is too dominant, what do you have? You have a big break. So if you're, oh, it switches too hard. However, if you can kind of unite them, if you can kind of let them both hold on to each other, you've got a little bit of the bottom part, you've got a little bit of the top part, oh, I can make that smooth transition. And again, this is like a huge, huge breakthrough because all of a sudden, here's somebody who can say, anybody can learn to sing this way. You don't just have to be born with it. You don't just have to add more breath control, more breath support, all of that stuff. Anybody can learn to do this. And that's why most modern singing techniques are more inclined to look at what's going on in the throat, which leads us to our fourth breakthrough with the science of singing. Finally, the doctor Ingo Tietze in 1994 decides to stick some electrodes into people's throats to measure what's going on in the muscles in the throat. And it's not a pretty experience. They insert a needle into the muscle in your larynx and he's measuring the different nerve impulses in the muscles. But the singers that could actually stand it 
we learned some very, very interesting things. Now, the sa sample sizes of these experiments are very small, and the experiments <laughs> themselves, for obvious reasons, right? And the experiments themselves were actually very, very short. But what we learned was that actually different muscles in your voice activate as you're singing from low to high. And the idea is that no one actually completely turns off and the other one completely turns on. You want to have them both working at the same time. So rather than, oh, and having a big old break because one just completely disconnected from the other, you have both of them working simultaneously. And that's why this is so important that most modern singing techniques are actually giving exercises to coordinate the muscles in the voice. So rather than, hey kid, you just need more breath support and with enough time, uh, you're gonna get there. No, actually we're giving direct, does that ring true for you? Uh, we're actually giving uh, exercises that are tailored specifically to that person and to that person's voice in order to help them achieve that new muscular coordination that we're looking for. Now, where does that all bring us today? That brings us to our fifth breakthrough. I don't have a lot of time to talk about it, but basically we're talking about vocal acoustics, the way that the resonances within the throat, within the voice, are either going to help or hurt what the muscles in your voice are already doing. In other words, when you guys sang a woo, earlier, why is a woo so much easier to hit high notes with than an ah? Because an ah makes me want to resonate so much lower than a woo. A woo resonance is so much higher and allows me to kind of track over that next resonance spot so much more easily than a ah. That's why if you go to a basketball game, a lot of people are wooing. For some reason, you don't hear a lot of wee but I don't know why. It should be equally easy. Now, all of this sounds really cool because it's all theoretical and it's all very cool to learn about, but I was thinking we would actually work with somebody for a couple of minutes. Now, I actually want to volunteer. I swear I haven't... Oh, my God! I didn't plant you, did I? Okay, good, good, good. Great. Do you have a big break in your voice? Okay, perfect. We'll, we'll find out, won't we? Great, come on up. You're actually gonna take. Yeah. Cool, so you're gonna take my mic and I'm gonna stand right there, okay? Cool, what's your name? Linnea. Hey, Linnea, I'm Matt. Nice to meet you. Cool, Linnea, um, let's see if I can get this arranged somehow. I was actually How's that? I was, I was thinking of signing up for that. When awesome! <laughs> I, I wanna be better at karaoke. Oh, perfect. <laughs> <laughs> it's exactly what the course is designed for. This is kind of like the ultimate karaoke. What are we going to do? Whoa. Can you guys hear that? Fantastic. All right. So, um, Lene, tell us just a little bit about you and singing. Have you ever had a lesson before? What kind of music do you like to sing and karaoke? All that good stuff. I think a lot of my karaoke playlist is ballads. Nice. <laughs> 80s ballads, 90s ballads. Um, Where's it at? It goes between like... Like there's some Lady Gaga and there's R and B and there's Dolly Parton and there's um Take Me or Leave Me from Rent. All oh, right. <laughs> awesome, awesome. So you're looking I, for a kind of both that lesbians. I play both parts. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> so so you're looking for that kind of like really strong belty yeah. vocal sound. Awesome. Fantastic. That's Adele? exactly Adele, perfect. Yeah. That's exactly what this technique was designed to teach. So um uh, Lene, what I'm going to have you do is I'm just going to have you sing a really, really quick scale, really, really simple five tones, so just to kind of get a feel for your voice. <laughs> You're going to be okay. I'll sing it with you if you want. <laughs> this seemed a lot easier when I was sitting over there. <laughs> <laughs> Give it up for Lene. <laughs> All right, Lene, so you're just going to sing a ah whenever you're ready. You gotta throw. You gotta cl clear the throat first. That's the first rule. Allergies. Yeah. Yeah. Ah. Nice. Uh, Keep going. Uh, yeah. Uh. So now we're gonna. How do I do this? <laughs> That's better. Okay. Great. Now do that same thing here. Ah. Keep going. Oh. Ah, Can I get more piano in the monitors? Ah, 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 Great. Am I getting higher? 
keep, yeah, we're going. We're going right through your break, baby. You're doing great. I feel like I'm being brainwashed. G- give me a few more, Lene. Uh, on you. it is. <laughs> All right. Okay. All right. Can I just ask you like how that felt aside from like all the nerves and everything? Scary. I know it's super scary. Okay. Well, it felt good when I was getting higher, but then I started losing track. Right, right, right. I got so, in my head voice. <laughs> you, yeah, you did. You went into your head voice. So when, when you got up to around that, uh, that top note up there, you were just kind of starting to actually go a little bit lighter. So you started off very strong, and then you got to that. Oh, there was just like a little bitty flip up there. And that is, that is not you. That's totally the scale. I'm just like, I'm giving you the worst possible thing because I need to hear everything wrong, okay? So what I'm going to do... You have to find your faults before you can get better. That's exactly right. <laughs> And check out my complete singing course, Master Your Voice. <laughs> um, so what we're going to do, Lene, is we're just going to use a couple of those really ugly sounds that I was kind of talking about earlier. That those, Yeah, 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 exactly. So rather than going so uh, pushy at the top and having, having that uh, at, the, at the very top there, I'm just going to have you sing a really, really ugly sound. Can you do me a favor? Can you go, na, 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 really ugly. Na na na. Uh huh. You're a little sharp. Bring me down here. Na na na. Na na na. Good. I'm gonna meet you where you're at. Okay. Na na na. Na na na. Good. Now here. Na na na. Na na na. I'm going lower. Na na na. Na na na. That's the way. How about here? Na na na. Na na na. That's perfect. Now do me a favor, Lene, and do that same thing on. Na 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 na. Na 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 na. All right. Okay. Now do that same thing and keep it bratty all the way. So rather na 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 na, and having that break there. Na 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 na. Super ugly the whole time. Na 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 na. Uh huh. Uh huh. There you go. Better than na. You went na. Let's do it again. Na 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 na. Na 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 na. Do you guys hear the difference? <laughs> it takes a lot of courage to come up and do that. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. This, this makes me think of Ayo. Yeah, absolutely. Ayo. Ayo. <laughs> All right. Fantastic, Lene. Thank you so much for coming up. That was awesome. Way to go. There's that note. Hi, everybody. It's question time. So, let's see. I'm going to try really hard not to knock anything over, but no promises. Uh, so, who's got our first question? I feel like back towards the back by the trash can, which is an unfortunate landmark, but here we are. What's your question? <laughs> Of vocal acoustics? Right, right. Yeah. The vocal, acu- I'm sorry. It's I okay. Repeat it. <laughs> sorry, for the folks at home, what was the timing on the discovery of vocal acoustics as a factor in singing? And, and Two part question. We'll, we'll, we'll allow a two-part question. Uh, <laughs> vocal acoustics, when, and was it a discovery or a rediscovery? Cool. Um, so vocal acoustics, I would say definitely discovery because even as, or as, as recently as 95 is when they started figuring out that different muscles in the voice were doing specific things. How long did we think that vowels were influencing what was going on with singing? for forever, for several hundred years. Um, However, have we been able to prove that until recently? Not really. 
um, because vocal acoustics is still so young and really within the last 10 or 15 years, I swear like a new book is coming out by some of the, the people that I follow every year saying, oh, you know what we wrote a year ago? That's not really true anymore because mathematically it's not exactly this thing anymore. So it's a very rapidly developing field. But the, the biggest way that we can study vocal acoustics now is with uh, spectrograms, which is actually kind of looking at what the waveforms are doing relative to the notes that a person is singing uh, and the vowels that they're singing. But you're right, solfege, Italian solfege, has been used to teach do, re, mi, fa, sol, la, ti, do. That's been used to teach singers for a very, very long time because you're using these very, what we call like the cardinal Italian vowels, a, e, i, o, u. You're training everybody how to use those uh, and that will help them kind of learn to sing better and to coordinate all those different notes in their voice. All right, we're off to a great start. So uh, we got a good question online that I wanted to uh, put out there. And the question is, how does one find one's perfect karaoke song? <laughs> I like to say, uh, stay about 75% in your comfort zone and 25% outside of it. If you're doing some vocal training, if you're not doing any vocal training, stay 100% in your comfort zone. <laughs> Um, I often tell my students, you want to choose songs that are difficult, but not a nightmare. Um, because usually there's a couple of notes outside of a person's range uh, that you can really, really find, and you can really develop those and coordinate those to get those sounding better. Uh, but if the entire song, you know, it's my, it's my first time singing ever, and I want to sing Bohemian Rhapsody, okay, well, uh, let's uh, take a couple steps back for a second. Let's work with uh, something a little bit easier for right now, and then uh, we'll work our way there. Excellent. All right, we're two for two. Uh, so, who's got a good one? I see somebody up on the balcony who really feels like they have a good one right there. What you got? How much is too much singing per day to that might affect the health of your voice, and how do you know? Yeah, that's a great question, and uh, kind of like Robin said, it, it really depends. Uh, it depends on, on, on the health of your voice, on the quality of how much you're using it. I mean, if I'm, I got another confession to make. If I'm doing like Dave Grohl, you know, several hours a night like he does, I'm going to lose my voice like he does. Um, Sorry, I don't, I'm a Dave Grohl fan, but uh, he, he loses his voice every time he sings. Um, so even, even people that are professionals still kind of toe that line. I would say in general, if you're doing pretty healthy singing, uh, pretty balanced singing, I got another confession, my friend, rather than just, ah, and just yelling it, um, I would say you could probably do an hour, an hour and a half of that of vocal training a day and probably still be totally fine. Uh, but the thing that I always like to remind my students of is I'm playing through scales so fast uh, and most of the time they're 13-note scales and I'm modulating them at least 12 times. I mean, that's hundreds and hundreds of notes that you're singing. So often in an hour lesson uh, with a half hour full of warm-ups, you're singing more in that half hour than you're going to sing in two hours on stage. And on stage, obviously, there's a lot of rest in between the music. There's a lot of times to, to talk to the audience, to, you know, drink water and all that stuff. But in vocal warm-ups, uh, I would say, you know, 45 minutes to an hour of that and maybe another additional half hour on a song would be good. Um, and as far as keeping the voice healthy, lots of water, good rest, no smoking, uh, no eating foods that are going to give you reflux or that you have allergies to. Just kind of the, the, the general ideas about having a, a healthy body and a healthy voice. Excellent. All right, we have another online question we're going to take as soon as I unlock my phone because I just did that reflexively. Uh, so the question is, how do these breakthroughs tie in, or do they tie in, with uh, linguistic anatomy and physiology? Oh, yeah, completely. So, um, it, so I'm not a, a speech-language pathologist. I'm not a linguist. 
Um, but speaking and singing are the same instrument. They use exactly the same muscles. There are some notable differences in terms of how long you're holding any one of those individual notes. Obviously, as I'm speaking right now, I'm making really, really quick articulatory changes in my voice. I'm not, I'm not making these very kind of gradual, refined changes where I'm worrying so much about pitch. I'm uh, really uh, speaking a lot more quickly because my intention is to communicate myself correctly. So in terms of how do these breakthroughs tie in to linguistics, um, I've actually worked uh, just this last week. I was teaching some fitness coaches at um, a gym that shall not be named uh, because their fitness coaches are yelling all the time. They're yelling for hours at a time. And it was my job to kind of go in there and give them some exercises and some warm-ups to kind of decompress what's going on in their voice because they're just, yeah, one more, you know? And it's just, if you're doing that for hours uh, and you don't have any warm-up or cool down, it's basically like going to run a marathon without having warmed up before. You are going to be sore. All right, so we'll take one from the crowd. If anyone is feeling it. Uh, dun, 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 dun. I see someone right there. Uh, sunglasses on the head. Sure. You know, what makes? Oh, oh, sorry. sorry. <laughs> I keep forgetting that you have to repeat. I apologize. I, it happens literally all the time. <laughs> uh, so, uh, what makes popular voices popular? Good question. Um, genetics and training uh, are are the, are the two, and oftentimes, um, I, I'm a firm believer that anyone can learn to sing. I've actually taught some people that uh, had been assessed as tone deaf before working with me, and now they can actually sing on pitch, and they can sing in tune, and they can actually track a rhythm pretty well, and that's uh, been very rewarding. But they've been working with me for years, and I wouldn't say that they're going to go and headline a tour anytime soon. There's, there's still a lot of other things. There's still a lot of other factors in addition to just singing on pitch and singing in tune and having a, a somewhat pleasant tone that's not too breathy or not too nasal, kind of in the middle of the road. But to, to answer your question, I think that actually a lot of the ideas of the old Italian school of singing were about that very thing that we love so much about Whitney Houston, which is the emotionality, the clarity of the vowel, the clarity of the lyrics of what she's singing, and how smooth and beautiful it is, rather than just being about ooh, lots and lots of power. That's not at all what she's doing. She's ooh, somebody, ooh, somebody, ooh. There's, there is very little uh, kind of operaticness in there. There's very little that has to do with, oh, she just needs to support the breath more. I would say for her and a lot of other singers, Freddie Mercury, Adele, other people that we really admire, um, there's definitely a pleasing tone to their voice. You know, there's something that we in general really like about the sound of their voice. But also, you know, because or as a result of their training, there's a lot of clarity in the vowels that they sing. There's a lot of clarity in the notes that they're singing. And there's an ease. There's a big ease in the way that they sing, um, maybe <laughs> accepting Adele here. Um, but like Freddie Mercury, for example, I mean, it, he makes it sound pretty easy. Somebody love! He makes that seem easy, even though it sounds very exciting to us. And it really is as simple as just, yeah, it feels very easy because he's worked on it so much. But somebody who hasn't worked on it, hasn't had that training, it's going to feel a lot more difficult. Thank you. All right. I think that was a really good uh, note to end on. So um, <laughs> we're going to go. I, I couldn't help myself. Uh, thank you so much. This was really great. Thank you, guys.